Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Hello. Hey. My name is Matt and... I'm Paula. Yay. Hello. And good morning to those of you online as well. We hope you're having a very happy Easter breakfast. Also, well done if you're here this morning, right now, because it means that you set your clocks forward, Yay. as you should have. <laughs> So good job, considering it's half past nine, it's an hour yes. <laughs> Yeah, we won't remind you of that or you'll be going, oh. <gasps> anyway, who had Easter Bunny this morning? Who, who did Easter Bunny meet any? Oh, Edward did. Yeah. Yes, and there's a few over here. Hey, good. Chocolate for breakfast, anyone? Uh, hey, Ruth. Did as yeah. well, brilliant. Chocolate for breakfast. Tom, yeah, hey. can't beat it. Can so you? who didn't have Easter Bunny and had to buy their own? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so well, sad. yeah, good. Let's enjoy this morning. Yeah. So a couple of notices for you. Um, youth and children's work is suspended for the next two weeks. Youth work, so no yeah. youth work for Easter until holidays. you go back to school. Um, and also the real meal would normally be the first Monday of the month. It's not this month. You are meeting on the 15th of April. Mm -hmm. So men, do not turn up at the Woolpack tomorrow. Well, you could do. You could, yeah. Enjoy it if you do. <laughs> Have a great night. But you might not meet many people there. Um, on the 15th of April, that's when the real meal is on at 7pm. At yeah. the Woolpack. There yeah. you go. Perfect. So if I said to you now, he is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Yeah, one more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amazing. Now, I would want you to, if you can speak a different language other than English, I'd love you to shout it at the top of your lungs in that language, if it's a second language, third language, a native language. So we'll do it again. Ready? He is he risen. He is risen. Yes. Louder, louder. Yeah, louder. Very loud. We want a bit of enthusiasm. Ready? He is he risen. Is risen. <laughs> Yay. Well done. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So um, before we go into worship, I was just going to bring a little message. I was looking at this last night, and I think it's quite apt for this morning, for Jesus' resurrection. And it's a prophecy in Isaiah 25, and it says this. In Jerusalem... The Lord of heaven's armies will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world. It will be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine and choice meat. There he will remove the cloud of gloom, the shadow of death that hangs over the earth. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever all insults and mockery against his land and people. The Lord has spoken. In that day, the people will proclaim this is our God we trusted him and he saved us this is the Lord in whom we trusted let us rejoice in the salvation that he brings hallelujah so let's stand and pray as we go into worship God thank you so much we're here to praise your name this morning we celebrate the works that you have done we celebrate Jesus's resurrection death has been defeated forever Lord because of you because of what you have done Despite the weight of sin and shame that you took down with you, Lord, you came back because you are more mighty and more powerful than everything. You are more mighty and powerful than death. You are more mighty and powerful than any guilt or sin or shame that any of us have on our hearts, Lord. So we hand that over to you this morning, Lord. And we say, Lord, give us new life as we celebrate your resurrection. Resurrect us, Lord, so that we can proclaim your name as worthy and glorious. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.
you so much that we get to remember that. Thank you so much for everything that you have done in our lives. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for giving us that resurrection power that you have. So now we have God. We are so, so grateful this morning.
while we're in that place of gratitude, just think of something that you're really grateful for. And you can call it out. never forget where they've all come from you're the author of everything the lifter of our souls and you are so so good
in the congregation.
please take your seats. We're going to pray together. Lord, we thank you for this Easter morning, for the gift of life. We thank you that on Friday you said it is finished. And this morning you rose again to declare that death has been beaten and invite us to follow you into eternal life. You rescued us that we may never again be alone and lost, but we can know love and belonging with you and your church. Lord, we think about the world you created. We pray for all Christians around the globe who will be celebrating you at different times throughout today. We pray particularly for those that have to celebrate in secret. We pray that your spirit will be with them and among them in power to sustain and strengthen them. Lord Jesus, you said, I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. We pray for those that have to keep their faith in you completely hidden, and pray to you in the secret places of their hearts, even as outwardly they follow the faith of their family. Let them know that you see them, and you know their hearts. Give them a sign today that you are with them and will never leave them. Lord, we pray for those in war-torn countries where Easter worship will look very different this year. May they be able to lift their eyes to you, even through the fear, loss and heartache. As ever, Lord, we pray for a ceasefire and for peace and reconciliation, even in those places where it seems impossible. For you, Lord, all things are possible. Lord, we pray for your church this day. We pray as you did for us to be one in you, one family, no matter denomination, nationality, gender, age. May we spiritually join hands across all divides so that your love stretches across the globe in all direction, unhindered by your own people. We join with the psalmist who said how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Let us learn to celebrate our diversity in your name and for your sake. Lord, we pray for the UK today. We pray that your spirit will move powerfully across the whole land. We pray for more people to respond to your call. And Lord, use each one of us to further your kingdom. We are willing and we say we are here. Take us, Lord, use us. May we respond to every call you make on our hearts, our time and our voice. May we faithfully proclaim you to all who will listen. Lord, we pray a blessing on our family here and online. As we celebrate you this day, may your fragrance go with us, even as we carry on our day after this service. May your kingdom fragrance and blessing be on our lips, and we pray that love and peace will be the currency in each and every home today. Let us love each other as you have loved us. As we continue to worship you this morning, Lord, may your spirit move among us. Open our minds and hearts to receive your word this morning. Lord, have your way. Holy Spirit, we say you are welcome here. And we want you to do whatever you want to do among us today. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, as we continue to worship, we will be taking up an offering, and that's a continuation of our worship to the Lord. Now, if you're a visitor here, please, please just let the basket pass along, because you are a visitor, and we want to bless you today. And uh, may God's love be with you. Amen. Let's stand to worship. Yes. 
There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Hallelujah. Let's just uh, keep lifting our voices and praise the Lord. Jesus, we give you glory. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we declare you are the risen one. You are the one who has conquered. You are the one who has the victory over the grave. And Lord God, we stand today in that victory, Jesus. Lord, we stand today in the power of your resurrection from the dead. We trust in your uh, return, in your coming kingdom, in the fact that you will make everything new. And Lord, we thank you that you begin that work with us. And so, Lord, we say, come and bring new creation in this place today, Lord God. Uh, bring your new thing in the power of your Holy Spirit as we look at your word. Uh, Lord, um, speak words of life into our hearts, Lord Jesus. Breathe life into our weary souls. Wake us up, Lord God. Uh, Lord, let your kingdom come in our lives and in our hearts this day. Lord, we open ourselves to you. Holy Spirit, we ask you will help us to open our ears and our hearts to what you have to say. Uh, because we want to hear from the King of Kings. We want to hear from the Lord of Lords. There's no one else we want to hear from today, Lord God. It's all about you, Jesus. So speak into our lives. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you want to take your seats. And um, yeah, here we are. It's Resurrection Sunday. And um, 
Amen. I think there's, if, if you're standing, there's no seats. There's some seats over here, I think. So if you want to find a seat, feel free just to kind of shuffle around. If you're, if you're comfortable standing, go for it. That's fine as well. Um, but, um, you know, our faith, our hope all rests on the, the certainty that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Amen. Amen. He is alive. And, um, and we're going to read from John 20 in the New Testament. So if, you want, if you've got Bibles, if you've got it on your phone, wherever you've got it, um, turn to John 20. Um, uh, if, you're, if you're looking in your Bibles, you don't know where it is. It's the New Testament. It's the last of the four Gospels. And, um, and the words we're going to read, these are some of the greatest words ever written. And they're describing the greatest event in the history of the world, the resurrection of Jesus. So let's just try and listen to this story afresh this morning and let it speak into our hearts. Um, We're going to read John chapter 20 and we're going to start at verse 1. So John writes, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Wow. Right, I want us to start with a quick experiment actually this morning. You've probably been wondering, what is this piece of paper sitting on, um, on my chair? This is what, what, so I want you to find this sheet of paper if you've still got it. If you've, if you've folded it and put it in your pocket or made it into a paper airplane and thrown it at someone, try and retrieve it. Um, you might be thinking it's really holy. There's something, there's something symbolic and, uh, and clever about this, but it's not. It's, it's, it's just a dot and a little cross, okay? And what I want you to do is it's an experiment. You're going to hold this at arm's length in front of you and maybe have the dot on the left and the cross on the right, if that's okay, right? <laughs> and, um, and then what I want you to do is I want you to close your left eye, okay? And I want you to look with your right eye at the dot and keep looking at the dot, And then you're going to bring it very slowly towards yourself. And at some point, the cross should disappear if you keep looking at the dot. Has that happened? Yeah? Keep looking at the dot and it will disappear. And then if you move it forward, if you keep moving it, it'll come back again. Okay, if you do it the other way around, you can close your right eye and you can look at the cross with your left eye and you can do the same thing and the dot should disappear. Okay? Who did it work for? Put your hand up if you, if you got that. That's, that's most of you in the room, okay? If it, if it didn't work for you, then you don't have an optic nerve and you are, you are very special. <laughs> so so what, what should be happening? Why does it disappear, right? Well, I, there's our retinas in our eye. Our retinas in our eye, and there's an area on them where the receptors don't respond to light, which is where your optic nerve kind of connects, and it's known as your blind spot. 
And, um, and it's part of a, your retina. It can't perceive light. So at some point, it disappears. And, and the point that I want to make here as we start is that we can look at something with our eyes, but we don't actually always see clearly. Okay? We can look at something with our eyes, but we don't always see clearly. And we're going to explore what that looks like in Mary's life and that of the disciples this morning. But I wonder, as you hear these words from John's gospel, and as we think about Jesus' resurrection from the dead, are you seeing clearly? Are we seeing this clearly? Do you, do you have this living hope in Jesus' resurrection from the dead? Or, it, or is, it, is it a bit blurry? Is it a bit unclear? Maybe it has been clear in the past, but this morning there's other things that are kind of clouding your vision as you, as you listen to this story. And my prayer is that God would give us eyes to see this morning. That he's going to bring revelation through his word. You know, when I, when I picture the resurrection narrative, I've always pictured it with the sun just rising in the sky and shining across at the empty tomb as Mary goes across. But actually, John's gospel tells us actually Mary goes to the tomb while it's still dark. Okay, it's, it's, it's really dark outside. Maybe it's it, maybe it's like 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning. It's early. I checked out in April. When does the sun rise in Israel? It's, it's about, it's about quarter, to, quarter past six. Twilight's about quarter to six. So maybe this, is, maybe this is five o'clock. If you came to the sunrise service this morning over on the wide downs, maybe you got up while it was still dark. Um, but, you know, sometimes it quickly becomes light, doesn't it, as we, as we, um, as we go. And Mary's probably wanting to avoid attention, to be honest. In Luke 24... Um, we read in Luke's account of the resurrection narrative, it was very early, he says, uh, and Mary has gone with spices to anoint the body of Jesus. And they hadn't been able to do this before because they were being obedient to the Sabbath. They didn't want to work on the Sabbath. And this is a very personal act of devotion by Mary and, and a couple of the other women, actually, who are mentioned in the other Gospels as being with her too. But we've got to understand, as Mary went to the tomb that morning, her hope has been crushed. It's been crushed. It's, it's gone, in fact. Jesus has been killed. And as far as she thought, he is lying dead in the tomb and her whole world has fallen apart. But the amazing thing about Mary is her love and her devotion remains. And this is beautiful. You know, I think sometimes when the, when the, when the other disciples are nowhere to be seen, here come these faithful women who really love Jesus and they remain devoted to him even in death. And she wants to honour him. You know, even though he has died, she wants to honour him. But when she goes to the tomb, she discovers it's empty. And, and for many of us, our hearts kind of leap at the thought of the empty tomb. But let's just imagine for a moment we're Mary. Um, you know, let's not, let's not think, come on, Mary, why haven't you seen it? Let's just think about Mary for a second. Because for her, the, the empty tomb isn't yet a sign of hope. In fact, it just compounds her grief. Uh, you know, she's not yet seeing clearly what has happened here. And I think if we were in her shoes, I don't think we would have seen it either. You know, verse 2 tells us she runs to Simon Peter and the other disciple, who's probably John, the author of this gospel. And she tells them what she thinks has happened. Her mind fills in the blanks, the missing information. And as can so often happen in these cases, if you're anything like me, you can do this too. You don't know the whole picture, but you decide that the bit of information you're missing, it's not good news. You don't go with the best version of events that is possible. And so she says, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. It was the only explanation as far as she can think. They've taken the Lord. We don't know where they've put the body. And she's speaking out of confusion and desperation and grief. So Peter and John, they come running to the tomb. And um, interestingly, John, in his humility, he doesn't mention himself by name in this passage, but he does want it to be remembered throughout history in verse 4 that he outran Peter and he reached the tomb first. And just, just in case you missed it, he repeats it again in verse 8. He wants you to know this important bit of information. Jesus is risen and John won the race against Peter in order of importance there. And, and so John, he kind of hovers at the entrance, he peers in, but when Peter gets there, he goes straight in. And he sees that the tomb is empty, but the grave clothes are still lying there. And again, this is another sign of hope, if we can perceive it. You know, if it, if it was grave robbers, um, then they would have taken the linen grave clothes because they were worth a fair price. But as it was, they, they'd left them there and taken the body, which made no sense at all. So John finally goes in and it says that he believed 
Even though they didn't yet understand from scripture, Jesus had to rise from the dead. But then they just go back to where they were staying. It's like, is that it? I don't know what they're doing. You know, there, there seems to still be some real confusion, actually, about what has taken place here. And, and what's worse, I think, if you'd notice this, as they go, these two sensitive, caring, self-aware disciples just abandon Mary and leave her there in her devastation crying. It's like, they haven't, it's like as if they haven't really even noticed that she's still there behind. She'll be okay. Maybe they're just thinking, we don't know what to say. This is a bit awkward. We're just going to go. We're going to go back home. I'm sure none of us have ever done that before, have we? Now, in verse 11, Mary is left there and she looks in the tomb again and she sees two angels who ask, why is she crying? And the angels should be yet another sign of hope, shouldn't they? That something extraordinary has taken place here. But again, Mary doesn't seem to be able to take it in. She just says, they've taken my Lord away. I don't know where they put him. It's all that she can think about. She just repeats this same thing. I don't think actually at the time she even realized that they were angels there. Um, or even stopped to maybe just think, why are there two people suddenly in the tomb who weren't there before? But she's not yet seeing clearly. And afterwards, obviously, she realized, oh, wow, they were, they were angels there. I just didn't see it. You know, not only is it, maybe it's still a bit gloomy. Maybe now it's getting lighter. But she's looking at everything through these tear blurred lenses of, of grief, isn't she? She's looking through the tears and, and she's not able to yet see the hope that is, that is right there in front of her. But now Jesus himself comes up behind her. And, you know, this isn't a sign of hope. This is hope realized. This is hope in person coming to meet her. But Mary, again, she thinks he is the gardener. And when you're surrounded by, by darkness and confusion and grief, and when you're convinced that hope is gone and is lost forever, it's hard to see things clearly. And just think about a moment about Mary's backstory, actually. You know, when Jesus came into her life, we read in the Gospels, actually, that Mary had seven demons. Now, you might be thinking, what does that mean? We don't know much about Mary's backstory or how things got to that point in her life. But what we can gather from this is that her life was profoundly broken before Jesus met with her. She was living in darkness. She was, she was really oppressed. But then Jesus came into her life and healed her and set her free. And in doing so, he saved her life. Suddenly, she felt truly alive for the very first time. And she followed Jesus and she, was, she became one of his closest friends. She loved him. She'd do anything for him. And she knew he was the hope of the world. But imagine the pain and the grief then for Mary just a couple of days earlier when Jesus was arrested, when he was, he was beaten, he was mocked, he was spat at, he was crucified. Her Lord died. And everything must have seemed like it was over for her. It was, it was lost. You know, Jesus was her world and now he's gone. How does she even continue? What does life even look like from here, even if it's worth living at all? And so as she turns around in verse 14, the last person Mary was expecting to see was Jesus. Her eyes, if you like, had adjusted to the darkness in more ways than one, but they couldn't perceive the light that was standing before her. And I wonder how many of us have a story that looks uh, a bit like Mary's in this chapter. You know, when we look back, we can see the signs of hope that we missed we can see the things that God was doing that we were oblivious to at the time. You know, maybe right now you feel like you are just walking in the dark and you don't know, you know, you don't know which way to turn. And, and if that's you, know this, God is still at work in your life. God is not dead. He is alive and he wants to meet with you right where you are. You know, in John's gospel, actually, I love this. Jesus meets with Mary in the midst of her grief. And then a few verses later, he meets the disciples in the middle of their fears in that locked room. And even in chapter 21, he meets the disciples in their frustration at having caught no fish again. You know, each time Jesus kind of catches them unaware. They're not expecting to meet with him. They're not even really looking for him at the times, but he reveals himself to them anyway. And he reveals himself to them right when they need him most. I love this 
about Jesus. So if this morning you're not expecting to meet with the risen Lord Jesus, perhaps you don't really believe at all. You know, maybe someone's just dragged you along here. And, you know, meeting with Jesus is the last thing on your mind because as far as you're concerned, he's not alive. Or perhaps you've lost faith. You had it once, but now you're not so sure. You feel like you're just clinging on by your fingertips. Maybe devastatingly, things have happened and you've just lost hope. You know, you might know Jesus is there in theory, but perhaps you don't think he wants to meet with you anymore. You know, maybe you've lost sight of just how much he loves you. You feel like your relationship, you've drifted apart. And maybe your heart has become dull to the gospel and you just can't seem to find your way back to Jesus, no matter how hard you try. Perhaps like Mary, you're looking in at the tomb and all you see is death. All you see is the, the emptiness. All you see is an absence of hope. But this morning, I want to say to you two words. Turn around. It's time to turn around. Turn around and find him standing there. Because no matter how far away you think you have gone, he hasn't left you. He is right there. He is waiting for you. And maybe like Mary, you're still looking at him through the darkness and the confusion and eyes filled with tears and you just don't quite see him. But just wait until you hear his voice. Now one, one word. Wait until you hear him call your name. Wait until his spirit touches your heart and floods your soul with hope. Because as he does, darkness turns to light. Confusion turns to certainty and grief turns to joy. Death turns to life. And I believe Jesus wants to bring people into life this morning through his resurrection. He is longing to meet with people here. He is just there behind you. He's, he's just whispering your name. Just hear him speaking to you. Saying, turn around, I'm right here. I haven't gone anywhere. You see, Jesus says one word, Mary, and everything changes. Hope is restored. The, it's like the whole world is made new again. Everything comes to life. And, and you know, it gets better and better. Jesus says in verse 17, he says, Don't hold on to me, for I've not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. This is my favorite moment of John's gospel, I think. Because right here, Jesus says something truly huge that changes everything. And there's a bit of a clue in the unusual phrasing that he uses here, that there's more to these words, and we just have to stop and take notice. You know, someone said this morning, I'm, I'm, um, I'm just going to, to my church and your church. You think, what are they on about? You know, or if I, um, I, I think Paula, my pastor and your pastor, is leading this morning alongside Matt. My friend and your friend. <laughs> you, think, you think, that's really odd. It's just not the way we normally talk, unless you're making a particular point, which of course Jesus is here. You know, throughout the whole of John's gospel, Jesus refers to God as the Father um, or as my Father. You know, so he says, I only do what I see my Father doing. Or elsewhere, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But he never says your Father until now. In light of his death on the cross, where he's taken away our sins, and in the light of his resurrection from the dead, where he has given us new life, he then says, I'm going to my Father and your Father. In other words, my Father is now your Father. Do you see? Jesus is saying, I've made the way for you to be reconciled to God, to become part of his family, to be a co-heir with me. You, you inherit everything with me. And where I'm going, you're going to come as well. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. You know, Jesus is saying, you are invited into the exact same relationship that I have with the Father. If you are in me, hallelujah. You know, John 1 verse 12, John wrote, To all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, in the name of Jesus, he gives the right to become children of God. And now 19 chapters later, we're seeing how this has become a reality. And we can see clearly in the light of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. You know, if you're, if you're here today and you, you don't know Jesus and you don't know God as your father, do you know what? This morning, this means you can receive 
Jesus Christ. And you can become part of God's family. This is what you were created for. You know, because of the cross, you can be set free from the power of, of sin. You can be forgiven. You can be released from everything that's ever held you back from shame and fear and guilt and things that weigh your life down. And through Jesus' resurrection from the dead, you can have a fresh start. You can have a new life with him that will never be taken away, that extends beyond death and into eternity. You know, you can live your life with Jesus following him, serving God, becoming the person he has made you to be. And it is all because of what Jesus has done for us. What is there left to say? Well, actually, like Mary, we can run to our friends and family and anyone who will listen and say, I've seen the Lord. I've seen the Lord. This is the best news imaginable. Just think this week, who are the people you can go to and say, do you know what? I've seen Jesus. I've met with him. This is what he's done in my life. This is the difference he's made. This is what he's done for you as well. You know, you can see him too. There is hope. There's a living hope through Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Hope is here. Jesus is alive. Have you seen him? Have you seen him yet? Do you need to turn around? Have you met him? Have you opened your heart to him? Have you given your life to him? Because if you do, you will see clearly too. You know, perhaps this morning you need to take this step of faith. And you need to stop kind of walking in the dark or, or peering through the gloom. Uh, maybe it's like you're, maybe you're a bit like um, John, actually. You're just kind of at the entrance to the tomb and you're just kind of peering in and, and you're, you know, you're a bit hesitant to go in. But maybe you, need to, maybe you need to step in and look and see and believe and realize that Jesus is, is alive and he has risen from the dead. You know, perhaps you need to stop looking at the world through the lens of your own fears or frustrations or maybe your ambitions or your doubts, or your confusion, or grief, and disappointment, and see the world, and see your life in the light of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. I want to just take a moment for us to pause, actually, and maybe, maybe you want to just, just like close your eyes, or bow your head, and um, maybe God has already just been stirring your heart as you've heard this passage of Scripture and it's like there's a little spark within you that is just that is just coming to life. There's, you know, maybe you're maybe you're just sensing His Holy Spirit just touching you or resting on you. You can't quite explain it in words, but you know that God is meeting with you. Maybe you sensed Him just whisper your name. You know He's there. And maybe the empty tomb is taking on a new significance for you this morning because you're realising Jesus is alive. And this is life-changing, world-changing. If that's you this morning, you just think, actually, I'm, I'm beginning to see and I want to see more clearly. And I want to know Jesus. I just want to invite you as we just as we ban our heads just to just to put up your hand to say, actually, I want to, I want Jesus to come into my life because I want to pray for you. So just I'll invite you, just put up your hand. No one's looking, the cameras aren't on you. Don't worry, no one can see. You don't have to put it up gingerly, you can put it up high if you want. I can see see that. Anyone else wanting to just say, say, I want Jesus. I want Jesus. I want him. Jesus come into my life. Thank you guys. Bless you. You just want more of him. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. And I just invite you, just you can echo the words of this prayer in your heart this morning. And um, and just know Jesus meeting with you. So Jesus, I just um thank you that you died for me on the cross. Jesus, thank you that you rose again from the grave. And Jesus, I believe that you are alive and that you want to you wanna meet with me here. And so, Lord, I give you my life. Lord, take my fears and my doubts and my failures. 
Um, Lord, take my shame and my sin and my guilt uh, away. Nail it to the cross. Lord, forgive me um, for, for my sins and help me to live my life for you. I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to serve you, God. Holy Spirit, fill me with your power and your life today as I seek to live for him, for the one who has set me free. You know, if you've, if you've asked Jesus into your life this morning, then he is with you. He's faithful to never leave you or forsake you. He has got you. And, um, and there's people here who love to pray with you. So if you're one of those people who raise your hand and you, and you do want someone to pray with you, or you want to follow up with a conversation or even just send in an email, if you're online and you want to do that, then, then do. Um, and, um, and we'd love to just follow up with you and just share with you and, um, and help you on this new journey. But for everyone here this morning, uh, may you turn around and find Jesus standing there. May you hear him calling your name. May you know the power of the risen Lord through the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. And may your soul be awakened to the glorious hope that is yours through him as you run to share the good news with others. Amen. Amen. I invite the band back up and we're going to respond in worship. We're going to sing a song now that sings about Jesus being the light in the darkness. So... If you're still unsure whether you're in the twilight zone or you're not quite, not quite light. Huh? Oh, thanks. <laughs> My husband honoured me. <laughs> um, yeah. Just feel free to sing this song. If you don't know it, if you're new and you don't know it, it's a beautiful song. Just let it wash over you. But yeah, let's respond together. Let's stand and sing.
feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working.
Jesus is alive. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is Luke 24. It says, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen yes. from the dead. Hallelujah. And if he can defeat death itself, how much more can he defeat any sin or shame or fear or guilt that you have? So let's remember that. Let's close in prayer now. Lord, we thank you. Thank you that you have defeated death. Thank you. You are here today, that you are here to meet with us. Lord, and I pray for each person here that you might have sparked something in their heart, that they will just carry that forward and they will just let that grow, Lord, and they will continue to seek after you, Lord. And I pray that those people can come forward with courage to speak to one of our pastors or leadership or prayer team, Lord. And let's just, let's just grow that. Let's grow that fire, Lord. And I pray that each one of us will go forward from today with a fire in our hearts, knowing that you are alive. You are with us. You are behind us, beside us, in front of us, Lord. And that we can go forward into anything knowing that we have you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen.